what we wanted to do is just give an essence of some of your experience with some practical examples in making the clinical trials feasible. I guess making trials feasible starts with the clinical trial design and, and my background in oncology is only 200 different diseases where we've got 7,000 different diseases at least here where we just rush straight to writing a protocol synopsis and um, hope that then we could take that and develop it and implement it. To, Kira, perhaps you could explain to us one of your early development ex programs and some differences between my approach and oncology. I'm happy to. Um, so Lumina Pharmaceuticals is developing products for rare cholestatic liver diseases, both in pediatrics and adults. Um, in the adult setting, I think there's a little bit more of a precedent. There's other companies that have been in the space, so we have somewhere to look to. In the pediatric space, it's, it's like that wall. It's a blank canvas, which is both energizing from a challenge perspective, but it's also very scary from a regulatory and clinical protocol development perspective. So we started with the KOLs, the, the mm -hmm. physicians who manage the patients both in the US and in Europe. And to be honest, we're, we're US-based companies, so we started at home. Um, and and we, we really try to understand from their perspective what, what they think about, what they're concerned about in, in terms of their patient's progression of disease. In parallel, we also started talking to families and parents and the symptoms of the disease that are most bothersome as a, it, sa it sounds mildly annoying, but really dis you know, disrupt their lives on a meaningful basis and give them the, the most concern in managing the care for their children. So our protocols try to merge those two perspectives together. And I think one of the biggest challenges for rare disease is coming up with an endpoint that meets the desires of the physicians who come at it from a very medical perspective, the parents who come at it from a very practical perspective, and then the regulators who ultimately decide. So I think that that's, that's the biggest challenge at, that, at, at the stage of protocol design and going, taking what we did with them, both the, the families and the KOLs and taking it to the regulators, both in the US and the UK, was how we you know, ultimately decided what studies we were going to do and where. Right. So really, before you got your pen to paper to write that synopsis, you spent a lot of time up front engaging both families as well as key opinion leaders. Yes, absolutely. Right. And, and Massimo, in terms of Egerion and the HOFH program, first of all, perhaps you could explain to the audience what HOFH is um, and then go into some of your experiences there. Uh, HOFH is homozygous familiar hypercholesterolemia. It's a rare disease with a prevalence of one in a million, so very few patients uh, worldwide. And uh, actually, we've been successful in getting approval from the FDA and uh, later on from the EMA with a trial, a phase two trial, which enrolled six patients, so really few, in a single site in the US. It's quite an interesting story because uh, this uh, molecule was basically adopted by the University of Pennsylvania for their few patients uh, which uh, uh, with a grant from the FDA they were able to conduct a successful uh, phase two clinical trial which then uh, led to a confirmatory trial, a phase three trial, which was then used for approval of the drug with uh, 29 patients uh, and ultimately uh, just 23 out of the 29 actually completed the study. So these, uh, in a way, I witnessed that uh, in my last uh, two years with, uh, with the Girion to the, the challenge of uh, having, uh, uh, you know, surrogate endpoint for uh, a, an orphan drug which uh, uh, allows approval versus uh, the fact uh, of uh, having outcome study which are more and more required from uh, regulatory authorities and uh, uh, I can say that uh, in a way there is uh, uh, less and less flexibility from the regulators to allow for surrogate markers rather than uh, having outcome study, which of course makes uh, approval for orphan drugs particularly challenging. So how do we go about setting those endpoints when we 
we perhaps don't know the outcomes or the natural history of diseases, what endpoints can we choose? Well, I, I'm not uh, an expert uh, <laughs> of, uh, of clinical trials. I've been uh, leading uh, commercial operations, so maybe it's more a question for uh, Sue. Yes, um, I think that as um, both Chiara and Massimo have just mentioned, um, obviously it's sometimes very difficult with these rare diseases where there's not a lot of experience um, and maybe no natural history studies to um, decide the endpoints to look at. But we, we need to look both for endpoints that are going to be accepted by regulatory authorities because obviously ultimately you want to get approval of the um, orphan drug um, that you're um, developing, but it's also very important to um, interact with the patients and the parents of the patients in the case of children at a very early stage because, um, as Kira, Kira was mentioning, um, it's important to get to what is important for the patient and the parent because ultimately you want to have um, a, an orphan drug that meets the requirements and provides value, as, as was mentioned earlier today, for the, um, all the stakeholders that are involved. And I think that's where um, networks such as the um, UK's Medicines for Children network that um, I'm involved with as their associate director can help um, because drug companies and bi biotech companies come at various stages of um, you know, development of their clinical development plan. So on the one hand, um, Lumina had very well developed ideas before you know, they would necessarily come to a network. Um, a network can provide help from the very early stage. So even with um, designing the study, um, the Medicines for Children network, which is one of several networks that are both um, disease specific or country specific, in, um, particularly in Europe, but I'm sure that you know, also in the US, they can um, provide access to um, a clinical trials unit that can help with the design of the study at a very early stage. But equally, they can also help the, um, the company to link up with not only key opinion leaders um, in, for example, clinical studies group that are speciality aligned, but also um, with the patients <laughs> and the parents by having links with advocacy groups. And additionally, um, particularly some of the networks now are developing young persons groups. And these are really, really helpful because you find that the children are really keen to take part in clinical trials and often have a slightly different perspective even to their own parents. Um, and they, they really, you know, take on board the science and want to help develop. Even, even some of the children have diseases themselves, some of the children don't. Um, you know, but they, they're working together and want to work with, you know, the networks, with industry and everybody to try and improve, you know, the, the lives of, um, the, you know, their fellow children. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to comment as well. I think in orphan and rare disease research, the traditional labels mean, mean should mean less. So phase two versus phase three, primary versus secondary endpoint. And... I, I hope that the regulators look at the body of evidence that's, be, that's around a drug. Um, and, you know, companies will come at, traditionally companies come at a clinical trial design in terms of, okay, what, you know, phase two is usually <coughs> 100 patients, you know, whereas we just heard about a phase two that was six patients. So, you know, the, the norms get thrown out and they, in some ways for rare disease they should be thrown out. And instead of picking an endpoint as your primary is the one that you think you're most likely to hit. Um, maybe the secondary endpoint actually is one that's more meaningful to patients. So you know, it, just because a study had a primary endpoint that was, that was one thing, like a biochemical surrogate, uh -huh. but had a secondary endpoint that was, for example, quality of life or something else like that, doesn't mean that that drug shouldn't be approved on the basis of quality of life because it wasn't the primary endpoint. So I think there needs okay. to be flexibility in the terminology around how you categorize the data that you collect. Mm -hmm.